Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Uh, we are going to do a very exciting interview today on the long form uh, episode, the weekly long form episode. Today, we're going to talk about Buffalo and we're going to uh, bring in Ron Fino, who is uh, the expert's expert when it comes to uh, Buffalo and the Tadaro crime family, or the I should say the Magadino crime family. Right. Um, and we're going to talk about some old school Buffalo stuff uh, and it, <laughs> give people some insight into the how that family works uh, from, from an insider's perspective. Uh, Ron's uh, dad and uncle were both made guys under um, Stefano Magadino when that family was at its, you know, uh, at, at its apex. And uh, just really excited to uh, kind of get that insider's perspective. Thanks, Ron, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, Rod, just tell us, give us a little background on your family and your your uh, dad and your uncle and how they got hooked up with the Magadinos. Well, my father had told me the, the some of the stories, but also Sammy Pieri would tell me about my father. He started during the days of the, the bootlegging. Right. He was a security guard uh, when they were bootlegging uh, liquor in from Canada and sending it around the country, places like that, Detroit, Chicago. So he, it was a very a prominent position for him. And he eventually uh, was brought into the family, and he was made. My uncle Nick was much later on, but my father became the uh, actually he became the acting boss of the family. Right. Well, I was a child at the time. And the only time I ever met with the old man, that meant Steve Bagadino, Stefano, was I was a baby. And my father was in the Black Rock Hotel, which we referred to as prison. In fact, a funny story, not to interrupt, but I was going out there with my mother and my aunts, and I was just a child, and we went out there, and we, they called it the Army for me. My father was in the Army. And we went out there, and who's working outside the Attica is Danny Sanzanese, who was a- Danny a, Boots, a, Danny Boots. Yeah, Danny Boots, because he got caught stealing the, the boots at Twin Fair. <clears throat> and he was working outside the gate, and I say to my mother, Hey, my uncle Dan's in the army too. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to the military. Yeah, but uh, then uh, I got to start. I went out to see the old man uh, with my mother. We had to give the gratitude. He was waiting in line as the guest went into his house out in Niagara Falls, Queenston. And I remember vaguely, very vaguely, and I remember him hitting me on the top of the head. And uh, my mother was upset because he gave me five dollars. She thought that, you know, with all the money that he was taking, and we were poor, we were on welfare at the time with my father in jail, that he'd do something, but he didn't. There were those that did. Freddie Rendaccio, who I liked. I mean, I liked Freddie. And Freddie was an underboss, right? He was the underboss. And he, him and I became very close. And his brother, his brother Vic, when Freddie went away, his brother Victor, who was the head of Local 210, and I had it, had it out. But then we became close as well because of the so much problems with the unions, things like that. I want yeah, to so let, just let the audience know that, like, uh, in addition to Ron being a um, organized crime figure uh, back in the day uh, with a buffalo and his dad and his uncle being made guys, he was a major, meaning you were a major uh, power player uh, in the Teamsters. The labors. It started with the labors. labors. Okay, labors. But right. I did the Teamsters. I actually had to go negotiate for local Teamsters. And I knew them all. You know, I, I knew all the heads of the families, most of them anyway. I never knew Gotti or Giganti. Uh, but, I mean, we knew Carbo and the boxing. You know, we were always getting together with the different families. Cle uh, 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 Cardo was very close to me. I liked to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Joe, we call him, you know, we call him Joe Tony. So you got, you, people called uh, yeah, Anthony Cardo called. Joe Batters. So yeah, a lot of I didn't call him Batters. I just no, call him Joe. Joe B. But it's interesting because I hear a lot of people refer to uh, old timers that refer to uh, a Cardo as Joe B. And unless you were, you know, someone that knows the language, you would never know because Anthony Cardo's, you know, yeah. Tony A or AA. Yeah. But because of the Joe Batters nickname, a lot of times people call him Joe B. Yeah, that's like, a, you know, Jack Licavelli. Right. Out of, out Jack of Cleveland White. was very close. To, I like Jack too. And I liked uh, Johnny Riggy out of uh, Jersey. I knew most of the Jersey people. Not. The bosses, so to speak. But well, Riggy was the boss. Yeah, he was the boss of, uh, uh, if, if you want to call him that, it was the, the Cavacante family, yeah, he was right. the head. Right. But there was different alignments that went back and forth because Johnny would tell me everything. 
Johnny opened up to me about a lot with Genovese, the Gambinos, the Bananos, you know, so. But getting back to Buffalo, so I'm growing up in this era, and finally, you know, I started meeting, uh, my father was in gambling a lot. He We'd make the rounds, as he referred to them on Saturday. We'd get together with the Spanos, the Sanzanese, the uh, Eddie Shalea, uh, I mean, this is Pat Natarelli, Freddie, you know, Freddie Rendaccio. And we get together on that. Then we go have to visit the, the gambling uh, spots where they're taking the book. And they would have the door blockaded. The men would be all around in their shorts uh, with the doors barricaded and the flash paper. So that was my early upbringing into it. Later on, they wanted to have me made. Sammy Peary wanted me to be made. He wanted to be a mobster now. Uh, by this time, I had already started cooperating on my own. There was no twisting of my arm. Uh, as you may call, you say, I'm a walk-in, but that wasn't the case. Little did I know that the FBI was grooming me. They seen me as someone that was different, that I didn't go to hang around with the wise guys. I had my own friends in South Buffalo. And, and they, I, this I didn't know. Then later on, I learned that they were grooming me. And it got to the point, one time I'm playing tennis with this FBI agent, Ron Hedinger. And by this time, I was in the union. And, you know, I was critical of him after he introduced himself. I said, you know, you guys should be ashamed. of You guys and gals should be ashamed of yourself. We have workers out there suffering, and you're not doing shit squat. He says, Ronnie, if someone like you could help, we'd be more than happy. I says, I'd be more than happy to help you, except for one thing. I never, ever want to mention my father, my family, or areas like that. That I will not go into, and I have to have your assurances on that, which they gave. And it started, and that's how it started. And there was a time, one time, when I got caught with this one agent, Jack Porstel, in the car by a, a, a deceased mo a mobster who they killed, actually. Ooh. His daughter's a good friend of mine, Billy Shalino. Oh, Billy the Kid. Yeah, yeah, Billy the Kid. They killed him, and the daughter's still close to me. And uh, before I go into that, uh, so he spots me, him and this Nicky Ronaldo, uh, who was an associate of uh, Danny Sanzanese. They see me in the car in the front seat with Jack uh, with Jack Porstel, who was an FBI agent. Now I have a problem. I have to cover it up. What am I going to do? So I explained to Jack what to do. You just drop me off at the Union Hall, leave you know, the car where it was, and I'll, I'll come up with an answer. Well, I get called. No sooner did I hear about that Sammy Frenchaboy, who was the boss of the family. Yeah, the, at the, the, the farmer, right? The farmer, yeah. He's the boss of the family, Says states to me. He says, Ronnie, you know, you got to come and see Sammy. Or someone said to me, you got to go see Sammy. So I drove out to uh, Angola, which is on the lake, was quite a ways away. And I go sit with him. He was in his garden picking his zucchini. And I go tell him, I said, Sammy, I know what you're thinking, but you have it all wrong. I says, I was standing in front of the union hall and these two agents. I took a gamble and said two because the FBI normally doesn't pick up with one agent. Right. So I told him that uh, there were two agents that come. One was in the back seat and they told me to get in the car. They wanted to take a ride and they're saying, you know, they were telling me, Ronnie, you're a good kid. You don't need this life. We can help you. There's a lot we can do for you. But, you know, I told listen, if you want to talk to me, you have to talk in front of my attorney. Right. I can't do this. Now, I'd appreciate it if you dropped me off. And they kept driving around trying to convince me. And then I, they finally did eventually drop me off. I said, Sammy, that's it. There was nothing that happened except that. You know, I mean, you know, and, uh, I learned a long time ago. That was fun. You know, you have to learn your trade craft especially in the business that I eventually ended up in. And I learned a lot of that early. Can you, can you explain to the audience and even to, to me uh, how, so Stefano Magadino or Steve Magadino uh, founded the family. Well, know, he didn't find, found it, but he but came Buffalo, up. Buffalo, the, Bill, Buffalo Bill found it. Yeah. Paul Mary. And, and you had the old, uh, what's the name? Uh, uh, JDs, the Carlos, right, they the Joe about, yeah. But, so, so, but, but Magadino led it from the the creation of. Um, yeah, he was a powerhouse from the '30s into yes. the 
70s, but it looked like in the 70s he started putting out front bosses, and there was this. A well, he did that. That was that actually started before that with Russell Buffalino. Okay, and, and quite a few of them. We had quite a few. Can you uh, explain the the mindset behind that? Yeah, because these guys were popular in their community, and they were very close to the old man and the family. I mean, I knew Russell Buffalino as well as anybody. You know, we would visit with him all the time. Uh, just called him Russ. You know, mm -hmm. and he was a, a lot of times the go between between us, the Genovese family, the Cleveland family, him and uh, oh, what was his name from uh, Cleveland became he's another Buffalo guy. I'll think of it in a second. Peanuts, Johnny Peanuts, Peanuts. Trunello, Peanuts. Yeah. yeah, he was another go between. <clears throat> and for example, when we go to uh, Cleveland, I've had a lot of times Peanuts arrange it, Leo Masseri, or somebody would arrange it. Uh, so. I mean, he did that. He he gave latitude. He did this up in Canada too. He he did this uh, with Volpe up in, in Toronto. You're saying yeah. you're you're saying Russell Bufflino would buffer these? Well, not that one. That was that was buffered by other people. That was okay. uh, Nicoletti and uh, Betty Nicoletti and some of the other ones that that eventually Tadaro uh, with uh, Johnny Papalia. Right. So, but it's it's interesting that Megadino. Uh, was alive until the 80s, right? No, I, I think he died before that because it was taken. Well, let's see, it was taken over because I know Peter real enough. His son Peter, his, I know, yeah, right. uh, that was taken over by the breakaway, uh, my father Danny Sansonese, uh, Roy Carlisi, you know, Roy Black Sammy's brother, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah, and Black Sam from uh, Chicago, Chicago, yeah, Chicago, Roy out of the bus. Right, Sam yep. Carlisi's brother was Roy Carlisi. Yeah, Sammy Frenchabori, uh, a few of them, Johnny Camilleri. You know, they were the breakaway pact. And what they did... What do you mean? What do you, can you explain what you mean by breakaway? Yeah, they were upset because Magadino was holding out on them. Okay. The old man was taking their money, and then they raid his house and find a half a million dollars and a lot of other belongings. He kept crying poverty. So they got upset. And now Freddie was in jail by this time. So, uh, as was Pat Natarelli, who was right under uh, Freddie. So, it gave him an opportunity to move in there. So, the old man, they took over, had a step down. And a lot of people think it was Sammy Pieri that took over. That's not true. Sammy never took over. They eventually moved my father in there as the fall guy. Little did my father know at the time that there's going to be a hit. That's going to be in my father. Later on, Sammy Pieri had told me all this. My father didn't know. Like but they were going to try to hit him the way they hit Johnny Camilleri? Well, th 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 that time happened also, but this was before that. Okay. This is when they were taken over from the Magadino family. And, and, and I just looked, uh, uh, Stefano died in 74. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. He, he lasted into the mid-70s. Correct. One of the spots that Vic, Vic Rondaccio wanted is because my father had this statue, he wanted me in the union. So Vic says, I chose the smart one. He had a choice between me and Danny Sands and he's junior. Uh, and, uh, Vic says, you know, I chose the smart one. We have this on uh, audio tape later on. And, you know, and I says, you know, Uncle Vic, I knew that. Well, not that I was the smart one. I never consider, I don't put no, you know, I, I screwed up enough in my life without putting any you know, feathers in my cap. But anyway, I went in the union. You know, and from day one, it was a nightmare. I could not do anything. I could not do my job. They didn't want me learning. They just wanted me to go visit jobs, talk to the stewards, don't make any decisions without Sam Bongiovanni or, or Vic knowing, because Vic ran the show. Sammy was the front man. He was the business manager. And then they had the Torito, his son, and, and Carl Bongiovanni. And uh, Pantano and Joe Latona. Now, I was close with Joe Latona, and I was still close to the family. Uh, so he would tell me and all that. He was glad to see me on board. He says, but this thing screwed up. Well, it got to the point it was impossible for me. They didn't want me doing anything. And I got I got so upset. This was after I was in there for a couple of years. I decided to run for office. My father said, Ronnie, you're going to get killed. Because my father was out of power by this time. And and Sammy Frenchamori was in power, the farmer. And you, you're going to get killed. I'm telling you something. 
So he went and created allies with Danny Sanzanese, but I had to promise Danny Sanzanese get a job. And I had to promise others. Now, I was well liked in the union at that time. I had the American Indians, uh, the Irish, the Polish. I had so many workers that I was trying to take care of secretly because they wouldn't let me take care of them any other way. And eventually the election came down and we won overwhelmingly, more than two to one. We won because the Afro-Americans and uh, Hispanics and the Indians turned out I mean, in the droves. They turned out in the droves. But no sooner am I in, Roy Carlisi calls a meeting. And I was asked to go to a sit-down at this restaurant, Italian restaurant. And in that meeting, they said, okay, you want, now you're ours. You are to do what we say. You are not to act on your own without that man, meaning Danny Sanzanese, bringing word back to us. Danny was made. The kid was made, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the little, son. little Danny. Yeah. So I'm there, and I started talking up. I said, you know, I, I'm supposed to brought a union here. Roy got tough on me. He got tough. He's who the fuck do you think you are? Don't you ever speak to us that way? Was Roy oh, a boss? Was Roy boss? He was. Uh, he was powerful. Roy was always a cop. Okay. Always. He came from Chicago originally himself. He ran a dice game. They called him the Clam Man. He owned a lot of clam stand. And so from that day on, I was controlled. So how do you think I feel? You know, I made promises to these workers, and. You know, I'm going to live up to it. I'm, I'm a fighter, too. And, it, you know, when you talk about Guyunes, I have them also. So I made sure I started developing my relationships with people. And one of the groups was, the, you know, the, the Bureau, that they better get off their ass and start doing a job here because they were not doing a job. You're making well, lip service, but there wasn't a job being done. But, but uh, Ron, I just want to add that, you know, my research – I, I see a big delineation and the time period that you're talking about right now fits into that because you're talking about the, you know, the seventies, right. As it's becoming the, becoming the eighties, you had a big shift in priorities in the bureau in the seventies. Right. When Hoover died. Yeah. And when Hoover died, the, all of a sudden the the new leadership there wanted to really focus on organized crime. And you had a full, you know, all the families, whether you're talking about the traditional mob activity or their infiltration of the unions, um, they got a full court press from the government from the 70s forward. Yeah. Well, just to point out, though, that I did help the CIA prior to that. I was in front, befriended by this Alphonse Hartle, who was assigned, eventually assigned to the Organized Crime Strike Force. He was an old OSS officer assigned to Russia. Uh, during World War II, to Avril Harriman. He was his assistant. And he was he befriended me. And I became close to, uh, well, who was the prosecutor? Not Mitch Mars. That was Chicago. Chicago was Mitch Mars, yeah. Yeah, no, I worked, I was close to Mitch, too. Mitch uh, was a great guy. Uh, yeah, uh, I can't think of his name offhand. He was a good friend of mine. Rest in peace, Mitch. But Mitch was the prosecutor on the uh, Family Secrets case. Yes, he was. He uh, died shortly after. Yeah, yeah. Rich and I were close. And so I started, you know, they asked me to look into a, a break in at a satellite office of, of the CIA, not far from Buffalo, uh, outskirt of Buffalo, where the, someone broke it. Well, it was the SDS at that time. And I happened to know one of the people. And they wanted me to find out what I could about him. So I looked into it, and I talked to this Arnie Stanton, and I'll mention his name. He was there, and I says, Arnie, you know, you got to talk to me. So he comes into the union hall, and he's, he, he asked me, he says, well, with the, you know, because I was also a worker before I was at the at, at office. And he asked me, you know, he says, I'm being followed all over the place, Ron. And he was, but he was incoherent. He was drugged up. He was totally off the wall. Now, I could understand him being followed because I'm sure he was, but I was never able to learn anything. But it did develop a report which carried on for many, many years. And even after long after Al died, I did do work, as you know, in Russia, yeah. and Eastern Europe. And that. Yeah, but, we'll get to that. We'll get to that um, yeah. later so, on in the interview. But can you can you just kind of maybe talk in, in um, general terms about 
the Buffalo organization and how uh, how they were viewed uh, maybe nationally, like when you were meeting with all these other bosses, what was their view of Buffalo? They were always respectful. They were very close. They, that they, that they liked the old man. The old man was a power. He had much more power than they give him credit. for. Yeah. I was going to say, that's why people kind of overlook Buffalo in New York. You talk about the five families, but uh, Buffalo was a, was a juggernaut for decades. Yes, it was. Yeah. There's no question. The old man had the power that slipped a little. And then there came a time after my father, that my father was called to the commission, and he went down with uh, uh, Roy Carlisi, uh, let's see, well, Stanley Sanzanese, and Sammy Frenchmore. And uh, the spokesman at that time was, uh, oh, what the heck was it? I can't think of his name offhand. But he was speaking for the Tommy Eboli, I believe it was. He was speaking for the uh, the commission and said, Joe, you got to step down. This so probably was- Salerno. No, it wasn't Solaire. I don't know. Yeah, no. I think it was was it Tommy Ebley? It may have been Tommy Ebley. It was Tom Ebley. Tommy Ebley got killed in the in the early 70s. Yeah, well, this was before that because okay, my father okay. had to step down. So I think it was. And they told me he had to step down. So then my father defied the commission. Next thing you know, they're asking Roy Carlisi, everybody they went up, they would go along with this decision. So my father was left all alone. So that was it. He had to step down. And uh, but what they did is they put Sammy Frenchamore in as the caretaker. Like I said earlier, my father didn't realize he was being duped when he took that position, just in case there was a hit coming out of uh, out of the falls or some of the old Magadino. So, so did he did he have it from the late sixties into the early seventies? Yeah, you? the late sixties to about uh, seventy two. Okay. Yeah, seventy just just after I got in office. Because then by that time, it was okay. Because by that time, we had to sit down with Sammy Frenchmore, who was the boss mm-hmm. when I was running. And he told me, keep it clay, you know. And they allowed us to run because they were going to kill. You know, my father was worried. And he had to have people protecting me. And that's why he's making all these deals, which to this day, I wish he didn't because I had enough support. I may right. not have enough support against with the mob, but I had enough support, you know, on the streets. And I had yeah. friends that would protect me. And you you mentioned about how you were your father uh, feared for your safety. People got to know that you no, know, just like in New York and Chicago and Philly at that time period, there were a lot of bodies dropping in, in uh, Buffalo. There were guys yes, that were, were you know uh, getting killed throughout the sixties, seventies, and eighties uh, uh, that you know made that a, a dangerous a dangerous area if you uh, crossed the wrong people. Correct. Correct. Yep. And so then I started. Uh, Sammy Perry put his hooks into me. I started a snowplow business where I was doing the Bartolo's malls. You know, I knew Eddie DeBartolo. And, and that okay, was so a Let people know that when he talks about Eddie DeBartolo, he's talking about the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, I'm talking uh, senior now. I didn't know the son. The old but, man I know, and I knew Gus Regis and Marv Rader and the whole but that team. Ownership, had- that ownership group that's been in place for 30, 40 years now uh, had – you know, organized crime ties for the 49ers, just to yeah. let people know. Yeah. Yeah. The Youngstown, Ohio crew. Right. We're from Youngstown. Youngstown had the wars. And so when we went down there, we first went to Cleveland, Sammy Perry and I, this was about 75 and they had the wars going on. The Danny Green and. Uh, yeah. So around yeah. 75 to 80. Uh, Cleveland yeah. And, and Youngstown the were, uh, was bomb town, USA. They were blowing everybody up. Yeah. So we had, we, we had bodyguards. We had to go see Leo was in the hospital at that time. Leo Mocheri. The underboss, and, Leo Lewis. Yeah, so we went to dinner that night, with, uh, which we did a number of times with uh, Jack White, Jack Wicavelli. Mm-hmm. The Blackie, boss of Cleveland. But, yeah, no. and uh, Macy Rockman. Now, he did have a string tie all the time, I could tell right. you. Macy, Macy Rockman was their, was their kind of Jewish he consigliere. Was. He was yeah. uh, uh, married to the sister of the former Don, John Scalish. He, uh, I, from what I've heard, Macy Rockman used to – or he converted. He went. He was taking communion. He was oh, a Jewish guy. That. Yeah, yeah I didn't a Jewish know guy. That, that. We, had a guy we had a guy in Detroit named Davy Boy Feldman who yeah. did this. Did the same thing as uh, Macy Rockman. It was a Jewish guy that, in order to ingratiate himself more with the Italians, converted to Catholicism. <laughs> but the Italians and Jewish were always close. Yeah, you know. I mean, I've never seen. You know, I've just talked to Carlo Gambino because I didn't know. 
you know, uh, what was going on with, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Meyer Lansky. I didn't know about him, but I knew of a lot of powerful Jewish mm-hmm. that were hooked up with the family, a lot of them. And you always would sit down with them and you would have to work with them. And they were nice. I mean, you know, you know, we, there was never no animosity there. It was just a matter of who, if Phil Manuel asked me one time, he was on the Ronald Reagan's Prime Commission, you know, what about who really runs the mob? And he says, you know, behind these people are a lot of Jewish. I said, no, you're right, Phil. You know, you never think about that. But there's a lot of Jewish business. But... Yep, in every city. And yeah. uh, there, uh, you know, in Detroit, we got a lot of them, even even uh, still today. I right, and... still got sports service in that. Well, yeah, well, and, and I don't want to be critical of them, but you no, know, in Detroit, you got the you know they the Purple Gang, which was like you know America's yeah. only real Jewish mafia that existed in well, I knew an, yeah, I knew an Italian guy that was part of that crew and, in Detroit, uh, Rocco Lapena. <laughs> he was uh, Rocky was a, a Purple Gang. Yeah, the Jew, the Jews, and the what became the. Uh, Detroit Mafia, the Tocos Rillies, they all work really close together. And yeah. so a lot of the guys, even today, the Jewish guys in Detroit, they weren't purple gangers, but they, they're they tied to old purple gangers. Right, right. Yeah. No, I know. I remember because I've been in Detroit many a time. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so talk, talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the, the relationship between you know, how, like the, the actual logistics of you working in the unions and you said that these guys are telling you to like, make sure you don't do anything without our Absolutely. say so. So how are you logistically running that? Like you're well, saying. What I, what I would do is do my best to weave in between. I would, I would create laws a lot of times. I said, we do this, we're breaking the Bolton Act. I'd come up with names. I don't know if there's such a thing as the Bolton Act. Right. You know, I knew labor law. I studied labor law, but instead of, you know, just Taft Hartley or Lanham Griffin, which I would use a lot too, Labor and Management Reporting Act 1959, I would use different laws that you got to check on this. And so I'd move around the country. And there's this next, there's this nexus point, uh, as, you know, when you were, when you were running things uh, that I think is pretty much gone by the wayside, it still exists a little bit, but it, it, throughout a big big chunk of the 20th century, if not the whole 20th century, there was this nexus point between organized crime and labor unions that were, you know, uh, you couldn't um, separate them. They were almost like one in the same. Well, not all unions, but so many. Yeah. There were so, so many. In the building trades, we always had the Teamsters, the laborers, uh, and a few others, the painters, and hotel restaurateurs. That was always controlled. There were others. I mean, but I mean, in New York City, everything was dominant. I mean, that was different. And uh, the Mason tenders in New York, I testified in that case, uh, which was a pretty, became a pretty big case against the Labor's International Union, and a lot of it went down. I testified in the Riggy case, which I had a very hard time doing, and, uh, and a few people got upset with me because I called him a quiet, humble man, which he was. I you know, I'm we not. Need, we need, you're talking about John uh, Riggy, Johnny, Johnny Riggy, Eagle. yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the boss, Johnny Eagle, Eagle. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't know him by Eagle. I just knew him right. as Johnny. Right. You know, I'd, and uh, we were quite close. And, he, and I had uh, I met with this kid, Manny, which I eventually testified against. That was down in near the Philadelphia or Camden, I can't recall, another area. Did you have any interactions with the, the uh, Bruno family uh, out of Philadelphia? No, I don't. I don't. I mean, uh, you know, and it's funny. That was always kept away from me. Not that it was kept away from me. I met with Philly people. Uh, but it's just that I never developed that association with them like I did Chicago, New York City, Boston, or that because I knew Boston quite well too. You know, I, I dealt with Arthur Coyle there, and I dealt yeah, with other yeah with so the labors. Let's um. And first of all, then I became a I became an international trustee for the labors right. training fund, so I was on that. So that opened up a lot of doors for me to meet people and bring Let, my ideas. In. Let's um drill down a little bit on uh, Russell Buffalino, if you can. Yeah. He, wa- he was the uh, Joe Pesci in the movie The Irishman. I- my opinion of him is, and I'll just, I'll, I want to get your take after I make this statement. Yeah. Um, and then I want to get your take on him as knowing him personally and then the portrayal of him in, in pop culture. So my belief is that in the last, let's say, decade, 
Russell Buffalino went from the most underrated mafia boss in American history to the most overrated mafia boss yeah. in American history. Like nobody knew about him. And now because of um, Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, uh, it, it went from nobody knowing about him to now where because of that movie, everybody thinks that he was this like wizard of Oz, like yeah. uh, puppeting the commission. Now he was a, he was a guy that was very powerful and, way more powerful than you would think for a guy that was a, a, a mafia boss in rural Pennsylvania. But I, I don't know if the mythology that's been building is accurate either. So give me your take on him personally, and then how you uh, like, or what you, uh, your insight into the film. Yeah. Well, first of all, Russell was always a mega deal. Don't people that think he had, he's like a super cop. You know, mm -hmm. they gave him, you know, as you said earlier, Magadino gave these people their reign over there is him and Chandra. Now, Chandra, they're all close to Buffalo. Russell was a go-between on a lot of these things. If he went to the Teamsters, now, I don't know the sheer hand. I know nothing about it. Uh, but I did know Joe Tiratola in New York. Joe well, if you say, But if you, you're saying that you knew Russell, you didn't know Frank, but doesn't that kind of uh, pierce the veil that they, uh, of, of legitimacy that they're trying to, meaning the Scorsese's and the De Niro's that are trying to tell you that Russell Buffalino never went anywhere with Frank Sheeran. You're saying yeah. that you knew Russell Buffalino, but you never knew Frank Sheeran. No, I didn't know him. Now I know right. Bob De Niro. You know that, right? I've been a Bob De Niro. But isn't that isn't this blowing their theory out of the water? If you're saying I I knew Russell Buffalino well, but I well, never I knew, knew Frank Sheeran. So isn't I, that? I, yeah, I mean, I knew the Teamsters quite right. well. I mean, you know, Provenzano and all the different people. Uh, in fact, they wanted to put me in the Teamsters. I don't know if I told you that. When I, it, it was uh, Jack Lucavelli wanted to be to move up in the Teamsters back then because Presser was screwing up so much. They needed a front man or somebody to come in. And, and Macy Rockman says it can be arranged. And uh, they went to Jack, Buffalo. And Jack Presser was was cooperating. Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't know that now. Now, I knew the agency would have been cooperating with, but that I did not know. I knew, yeah. about, the, I knew about the Cleveland leak. Just so people know, Jack Presser was a Teamsters union president, uh, yeah. and it, it went Hoffa to Fitzsimmons to Presser to Roy Williams. But I can tell you this. When I sat with Presser, he was a buffoon. I hate to say that about anybody because I never knock anybody's intelligence, uh, but he really did not know anything about the working class. His father may have known, and others did, and Tony Libertori was another. Now, Tony, I had to testify in this case against Tony. Yeah, he was a, uh, a Cleveland capo acting boss, Tony Yeah, Libertori. Yeah, it was, you know, because he wanted to know if I was paid, I, you know, and I told him, he, he thought I was without asking, and I had to tell him, you know, I'm not a made guy, Tony, so take it easy, because he's telling me all the secrets. He told me they had a leak in the office. That's where it first came out. Not from Friday on or that I learned about it and turned it in much earlier, but a lot of people in the bureau didn't believe me because I thought it was an agent. Yeah, just so, I, again, let's just clarify for the audience. Uh, in the Cleveland FBI office of the late 70s, early 80s, they had a, a secretary uh, that they had got their, the Cleveland Mafia had got their hooks into, and she was feeding them intelligence briefings uh, and it was uh, filtering out to Tony Liberatore, who was then giving those uh, documents to Jack Licavoli and other people. Correct. Correct. But Tony's telling me this. Now, he was a messenger to me. If I was down in Florida or anyway, they send messages through Tony to me. And I can't recall if it was in Cleveland or where he told me this, but he says, we, we can over access to everything. Now, I'm concerned because my name may be on there. Right. So I went back to the Bureau. And eventually, Jerry Persona in, in, in uh, Cleveland, one of the agents down there, and I explained to him. Now, I, for some unknown reason, thought it was an agent because I didn't realize the secretary could have that much latitude because I worked in the FBI offices. We used to have these green books with the 302s and the various files in it, and you just don't have access to them. You know, usually they're, they're kept quite safe. But in this case, you know, I didn't know it was a secretary, but I did know they had a leak. It, that, that was something that no one asked me to look at, anything like that, because they didn't believe me. You know, a lot of the agents didn't believe me when it took place. Would you go to visit Russell in Pennsylvania, or would he come to see you in Buffalo? No, no, he'd come. He'd come all over. We'd go sometimes to Erie, Pennsylvania. Sometimes Rochester. 
we'd meet in different areas, sometimes down in his neighborhood, you know, so. Uh, Did you have any dealings with the Rochester guys in the 70s? Oh, yeah, no, I know them all. What's the name? Rini, Rini Pecoretto's kid and I were very close, Lauren. And, I, you know, I knew the Valentes. In fact, what happened is they were pulling away from Buffalo right. because of the problems. And my it, it was the Bonanos that were back. Mm -hmm. Joe Bonanno and my father and John Camilleri got involved. That's what oh, that's what led to the demise of John Camilleri. Camilleri, yeah. And, he got killed in 74, leaving his birthday party. Yeah, correct. At Roseland. Roseland, yeah. Yeah, so eventually that's what led to Billy's killing. A lot of people don't know this. The, the, the Billy the Kid's killing was tied to Camilleri? No, it was tied to uh, Rochester. Oh, they Rochester. thought the mob, because he was going to Rochester all the time, uh, and they thought he was meeting with the mob over there. In reality, he was uh, seeing his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. He had a girlfriend in there. But and I, uh, I believe the uh, former <laughs> acting boss, consigliere, um, Lenny Falzone, was... Uh, considered a suspect in the uh billy the kid well it couldn't have been lenny because lenny was in my office at the time uh, i'm not but saying they, in terms of a shooter i'm talking oh about yeah yeah no uh, setting I mean, it in setting yeah, it was in mike motion. muscarella and, and a couple others you know were involved in the shooting that's my guess yeah now what happened it's funny i'm holding a grievance meeting in the union hall the very time billy is being killed and i have contractors there and the next thing i'm being surrounded by leonard Feld's own Danny Sansonese, Joe Tedaro Jr., they're all in the room with me. I say, yeah, it's pretty good. And the Pieris, the boys, I say, yeah, it's pretty good. You're finally taking an interest in the business. <laughs> yeah, they're taking an interest in the business. What was, Lenny, what was, what was Lenny Fells on like? Lenny could be ruthless. He could be nice. Him and I get along. He could be nice, but he could be ruthless. He'll kill you. He would go after, he would have his son, who was a paper boy, go after that $5 he was owed. Just as much as he'd have to go after large bills, he wanted to take it. He'd go, he'd go after it himself, if it, you know, what they stole from his kid. So he he was a tough guy. He took the front a lot, you know. He was a front man for Joe Tedaro uh, Jr. Yeah. Well, uh, just for you know, for my own um, to satiate my own uh, interest, let's just come over to Detroit for a second. Yeah. And uh, you know, from my research, you had. Uh, Lead Pipe Joe, Joe Todaro Sr., and Lenny Falzone, and in some cases, uh, Big Joe Todaro Jr., uh, that were making a lot of trips to Detroit in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I think some of it was related to labor stuff, but other uh, reasons what was related to uh, Las Vegas. And they were, uh, it looked like they were uh, jointly partnered on some uh, Las Vegas investments. Yeah, they had less, well. The, what they had out there is the Golden Fleece, yeah. the Flying Fleece. Excuse me, the Flying Fleece. They would fly people out there. We'd put them up in the Tropicana or some other places, but mostly the Trop, because we had the connections there. Right. And, and that's when my good friend Dennis Combs eventually became the head of uh, the Traps, the Trop organization, and he was a very close. He's the one that really undercover, you know, uncovered the skim. They were actually, well, yes, I did know that. The uh, One of the investments that Detroit and Buffalo were doing together was a investment in a hotel casino about 90 miles out of Las Vegas in Laughlin called the Edgewater. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. And uh, the Todaros oh. were uh, coming in for a piece of it. The Detroit guys were building it. And I have all these surveillance reports from 80, 81 of uh, Lead Pipe Joe, Lenny Falzone, coming into Detroit, getting picked up by Zerilli and Toko guys at the airport, taken to the hotel, driven to, uh, you know, meetings with uh, Toko and Zerilli, and then them meeting out in uh, Vegas as well. So there was, and then actually, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm pretty sure that Lead Pipe Joe was an unindicted co-conspirator in the uh game tax case that you came to detroit for in 90 97 yeah, that, 98 yeah that i'm not for you know as much as i testified on that case i yeah. don't remember i think one of the Tudaros was an unindicted co-conspirator based on these vegas yeah. dealings because even though the detroit case came down in 96 it was a case that dated all the way back uh like 30 years 
So there were some guys. It's just interesting that you don't think of Detroit and Buffalo as working together. You think of Detroit and Chicago or Detroit and Cleveland, but Detroit and Buffalo were doing. Uh, oh, no, we were always close. I recall yeah. going there all the time. You know, I, you know, I was close to the Zarellis. I yeah. knew the Zarellis. I, I knew Jack uh, Toko. You know, I didn't know him that well. Like I knew the Zerillis and others there, and I knew, but I knew Jack, and I knew he was, you know, who he was, and I had a lot of involvement with the labor unions there. We had a problem with a contractor called Phil Schwab, who was not kicking back to the Tenaros. And and then those days, just so you know, we called Joey. Uh, who you call Big, Big Joe? Big Joe, now. you call him Joe Pizza, right? Joe well, Pizza, right? Yeah, that's what that. It's, it's funny because the the media nickname is Big Joe, but whenever I talk to people in Buffalo, they call him Joe Pizza. <laughs> yeah, I never knew him by that. His father yeah. was Big Joe, and JT we called him Papa and, Joe. You know, I got along Joe. good with the father. Yeah, I did get along good with Joe. In fact, one time we were down in the uh, Lenovo Pizzeria in the basement. And I told him, I got to be honest with you, Joe. You got to get the F out of this business. You got to get out of it. You're making good money. You don't need this stuff. He says, Ronnie, if I got out of this business, I wouldn't have this stuff and it'd be all taken from me. Because I did like the guy. And I'm not going to lie. That's like, you know, I, I, I don't. And a lot of times if I didn't know something, I didn't want to know it. Mm -hmm. I could only stay with focus. I don't want to be focused on what someone else has told me. You know, just what I know personally, I, I've testified in so many cases that I've learned the best thing is to do is keep it simple, keep it truthful, keep it focused. Don't go into other areas. So a lot of times these things would come up to me about their other activities, and I'd close my ears. I mean, you know, we were out there one time, and uh, Joey Mazza from Chicago, he, he was with the Labors International, just under, uh, uh, you know, Carter liked them. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, there was a lot of them, Bruno Cruz. So. And I could tell, uh, you know, a lot Bruno, about Caru Bruno Caruso still kicking on the south side of Chicago. Yeah, he's, he's mad at me. He don't like me. <laughs> he told Frank Collada, he said, like I was telling you, or I think I told you, Frank Collada and I were getting together out in Vegas. And Frank says, you know, Ronnie, you're the real deal. You were running with the big shots. I said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, Frank? He says, because I told Bruno Caruso, you were you know what he told me that? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to go fuck himself. I, I just uh, again a quick di digression. I'm not gonna name a name, <laughs> but there was a pretty prominent Chicago um, <coughs> wise guy who, uh, when I was in Las Vegas, um, was sending messages to the mom museum, <laughs> telling them that they didn't know what they were talking about in some of their exhibits. And it's yeah. uh, it's like uh, those Chicago guys are, 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 are they don't hold their tongue. <laughs> no, no, they don't. No, they don't. In fact, when I testified against the Chicago and the laborers, a lot of the wise guys were outside greeting me. They were being nice, Nicky DiMaggio. That was Roy Carlisi's nephew. Yeah, but I mean, when they were greeting me very nicely, Bruno Caruso would not. And they were not, and not quite, you know, well, the Caruso. I mean, the Carusos are like uh you know, a mob dynasty uh, on the south side of, of uh, Chicago. Yeah. They're like royalty, um, you know, that dates back to the, you know, the, the original old man Caruso was was uh, a skipper in the 50s, I think. So, I mean. Yeah. I mean, I had my, you know, my people there, too. I was close to a lot of Chicago people. Vinny Solano, another guy I liked. The, he ran he the was, north side. Ran, ran yeah, the north he side. ran the north side. He was, a t he was tougher. He was bigger, more powerful than you realize. Yeah. Because Joe, the. Uh, uh, Joe Carter would always tell me, Ronnie, you got to listen to Vinny. Vinny knows. He knows. You know, and uh, this is going way back with Vinny. So, you know, I, I know, you know, I know him quite well, Vinny. We get together all the time. For anybody I that's said, been to Chicago, that whole downtown um, Rush Street, that where it's just, you know, jump in the entertainment district, the nightlife district, uh, that was Vinny Solano's territory for, for decades. He ran that Rush Street area. And it's interesting how the Rush Street um, kind of ebbed and flowed, how it kind of started as a really nice area. Then it got kind of seedy. And now it's back to uh, being a, um, you know, kind of the, the place where you go if you got money in Chicago to go spend it. Yeah, well, that, that's right. And it's like, uh, what's the name? Uh, you know, the, his kid was close to me. Vinny's kid, Anthony, I would take him golfing. He was a nice kid. I don't know what's happened to him, but he was a very nice. Let me throw an analogy out at you. Um, 
I, I kind of see the Toko family here in Detroit analogous to the Todaros in Boston or in Boston, sorry, in Buffalo. In Buffalo. <laughs> uh, they there seems to be a ability, like a, a savviness, and a you know you're 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 feared, but you're also you're feared on the street, but you're also feared in the boardroom or in the in the white collar stuff because you're so dialed in and focused on your business and you're able to kind of be have one foot in one world and one foot in the other world and leverage one against the other and and in both of these cases stay out of prison i mean these two fa- these two families have been heavily involved for uh you know half century century of, of uh of mob activity and there's been very very little prison time but on the other side of it there's been dare i say hundreds of millions of dollars made legitimately yeah yeah well that's true that's like uh even with the uh, gravano his attorney is a friend of mine uh, tommy farinella that's the one that got him out of jail a lot of people don't know why he went to jail it was because of his kids were doing drugs well, the second time, second time, I'm, time, it, the yeah, second time, I'm not talking originally. Right, right. I'm not talking originally, but the second time because Tommy got a hold of me, and I, I told him, you know, you know, I wanted to see if there was something else he could use. You know, we could use him on that he didn't cooperate on. Uh, for example, in New York City, because I knew Local 23 was a Gambino union, and, and the Mason tenders here with, and a few other in Jersey. But anyway. You know, that's all right. You know, what he says about Joe Tedaro is true. Joe Pizza. Joe would go in the water. He so would this, make was a, this was a story that Sammy recently uh, told. And there's some doc, there's some FBI documents to back it up that in um, 1980, oh, I think it was early 86, a uh, couple weeks or a month or two after John Gotti took power, assassinated Paul Castellano, that the the Gambinos had gotten word that uh, Lead Pipe Joe, Joe Big Joe, uh, Joe Senior, had been critiquing the way that that had happened. Yeah, he and, was upset. He, I recall that. He was very, very upset. And Sammy yeah. and Gotti called for a meeting with Buffalo that took place in Florida. Yeah, and according to that. Sammy, they were on the beach, and Joe Pizza. Uh, Joe Jr. They went out into the water, yeah. Like, and, and they uh, they had to turn in a certain direction because yeah, they thought yeah. there could be like, you know, like they sonars they, they, coming in and listening to them. Yeah, they had and, a and turn. They to had the their, and then they had their they had their conversation. That's so, true. That's yeah. what they would do. I remember Gaetano Michelli. That's Tommy Chuch's name was. He would say the same thing when they, the Tenaros at one time owned a hotel there. Yeah, you know, the Golden Strand. Right. And later on, Joe the senior would stay at the dip. He had a he had a room in the diplomat. And, and that's where they would probably meet over there and then come across because Joey Jr., I don't know what he had by the where he where he was staying after the Golden Strand. I don't know where Junior was, if he was there or not. When I'm he talking still spends he still spends a lot of time in Florida, I'm told. Yeah, oh no, he does. His poor wife died, Cookie. You know, I know her real well. Uh she's dead. I, I had put his nephew or his, his his brother-in-law, Linda's husband, into the labors. I had to bring him in as Joe was in there already. And, and everybody I mean, likes this guy. He he's uh, I've never heard of someone say a negative I, word about him. Uh, he's yeah. very prominent across Buffalo. His his pizza uh, pizzeria La Nova is has deals with the NFL and the NHL. He has no criminal record, so we should just state that his dad didn't have a criminal record either. I should say not criminal record, did not any no convictions, no convictions. Too. Um, and uh, you know these are, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, they're they're a phenomenon. They're well, a, a lot of it deals with politics too. Yeah, I mean these people are very savvy. We yeah. had politicians, and you know we've even had uh, a, a federal prosecutor, a federal U.S. attorney, that I criticized over this. Because he, you know, and him and I had a big, big argument. I'm taking a ride with Rob Blank for who was the special agent in charge of the Buffalo office. And he's telling me, Ronnie, you got to take it easy on this guy because I know you. You're going to blow up. Now, I know you don't get along with Dennis Vaco. I know you don't get along with him. 
I said, you know, the, I know how the guy got his job. Uh, you know, who was behind him? And Al D'Amato, you know, uh, who appointed him. I know the powers to be. And I've been informed like that, you know, early on by these people. And so we're in a hotel. We meet at a Holiday Inn out in Hamburg, New York, south of Buffalo. No sooner does Dennis Vaco walk in that I start tearing at him. He said, well, if that's the case, you're never going to fucking work in this town. You're never going to. I said, Dennis, you can't fire me, Dennis. And he can't fire me. And we're on Blankford. So you have no power over that. I'm coming out D.C. at that time. You know, I because I, I worked under personal services agreements. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the poor Rob Langford. That's the end of that tour. Well, what he did is he actually had some good agents fired. We had a lot of good witnesses. We had Samuel Legatuda. There were so many of them that we had at the Love Canal operations that would cover up at the Love Canal that we were working on. And Dennis refused to go along with it. He just refused. He would not do it and eventually became U.S. attorney. For, or or that he became a, a, a attorney general for New York State, and he refused to do anything. He'd cover up on all the organ on the, the uh, especially the toxic waste dumping and things like that. He was he was involved with uh, a number of big companies. Can I uh, throw a couple of names at you and just get your take yeah, on uh, sure. on who they were and what you thought of them? Guys that are no longer with us. Um, let's start with uh, Butchie uh, Bafalco, who I've heard. A ton of very <laughs> colorful That's stories cool. about uh, this guy was uh, really in uh, high IQ guy, uh, like a, a mob I guy. Don't know that he also... had high IQ. I wouldn't say he had a high IQ. Uh, but he was like an inventor. He was, like he was like a mob earner. inventor. What? Yeah, he was an earner. He torched yeah. jobs. He was a torch man. That's how he started uh, burning places down. But he. Uh, and he was married to Joe DiCarlo's uh, granddaughter. He was you, weren't you weren't impressed by his intelligence? I've heard a lot of people say that he was super smart. No, 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 no. He was a money earner, though. He was good. Him and Johnny Katz, they were brought in at the same time. That was during yeah. the Rochester Wars. Right. That they brought him in and made, and made them. And they brought Sammy from Rochester. What I forget his last name. And another guy. I can't think of it offhand. What because, about uh, Sonny uh, Nicoletti out of the Niagara? Well, he was always part of the Falls crew. Sonny, uh, it was a Benny Nicoletti, you know, and uh, he was up in the Falls crew. They eventually came under Tommy Gitano Michelli. They originally came under Patty Nate or Pat, Pat Titters. Right. You know, and then they came under, uh, 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 what's the name of it? Tommy, Tommy Chooch. So talk about the Niagara Falls crew and how that played a role. Like, how, how was the, the, um, the family split up? Like, how, Niagara Falls is kind of its own little thing within the thing? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. I mean, they gave him latitude. Uh, it's like I, I told you, I was close to Peter, the son. I got along good with Peter. We'd be, we'd be up at McAdoo's funeral home, and he had Camilla Lenny. And he was, to me, he was always a nice guy, the kid. But he didn't have that moxie, that strength that his old man had. That's what, as I visualize it looking back, how it's hard. Because, you know, I would always meet him. He was always cordial with me. Now, there may be where he was at times. You know, it's like Freddie. Freddie could be ruthless, but Freddie was always cordial with me. Uh, so, but then you had Betty Nicoletti. You had, uh, what's the name? Uh, Sammy Pieri was hooked up with them. I mean, there were so many up there. Uh, Ranjator, I could go on and on through the past and then the Magadino family. And we'd get together with Sammy Pieri, would still stay in touch with them because he'd bring me there. Sammy Pieri was more a mentor of me, not that I call him because I never along with all he was looking was to ride the tide mm -hmm. Sammy was looking to take advantage of you and in fact we got sat down one time we had a, a sit down with uh, his brother Joe Pieri who was above Sammy uh, and you had Sammy French Moore, Roy Carlisi, Joe Tedaro Sr. and and me now and even my father was not allowed in this meeting and Sammy Pieri and we and they told him we're trying to keep this kid clean now you're screwing up on us Sammy now it's got to stop you know you got this guy running all over the place. You want him to do this, do that. You're taking part of his business. You know, you can't be doing those things because he did. You know, but Roy did the same thing with my snow plowing business. He took over. I had to put Nicky DiMaggio on and give him the money. What about um, Dilly Spataro? Do you have any? Dilly uh... was quiet, ruthless. He, he would kill you in a heartbeat, Dilly. 
You just got out of prison. I got along well with him, but that's because of who I was. You got out of prison recently. Yeah, yeah. He, he was sentenced to life. Uh, and uh, it's uh, poor Bobby DiGiulio. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because Bobby was Robert Goulet, and I became close to Robert Goulet because of his he was He was Bob, Bobby DiGiulio was the bodyguard for yeah, so, a lot of guys. Yeah, so I flew with Robert Goulet to New York, and he asked me, he's having problems up in Canada. And I told him I'll look into it. Now I didn't go through Buffalo. I went through Arthur Coya mm -hmm. to look at it, yeah, to, uh, to break, a, you know, put a stop to his problem. So that helped Goulet out. And Dilly was convicted of uh, taking part in the uh, Bobby DiGiulio uh, yeah, yeah. murder, right? Yeah, yeah. Called I Bobby, so. the, Bobby the Body, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Bobby was a nice kid. You know, I knew his uh, the whole Giulio family, the Giulios and all that. You know, I knew them all. And it, it, to say he was a nice kid, he was just making a living. But whether you know, I don't know you call it, but I know Dilly was convicted, yeah. And uh, the Spataros, Luciano Spataro, Taro, right? And they called him Dilly because of John Dellinger. Oh, is right. that right? I didn't know that. That's what I was like, why do they call him Dilly? And they're he like, he was always oh. at the clubs, he'd be playing cigarette, he'd be gambling, he'd be at the gambling places all the time. That's right, see Dilly. Um. Why don't we talk a little bit about uh, he? Uh, Delhi was released uh, two years two years ago. Yeah, um, I heard that. talk a little bit about where you are today. You're you're uh, running a private investigative firm and yeah, I do helping that. out with some other government uh, activity. Yeah. yeah, what happened is afterwards, after I surfaced, which we believe came from the Justice Department. That's why people think the FBI and Justice Department. They've never gotten along. They have no choice a lot of times because of the, the politics that, put, you know, who gets the job, things like that. Rob Langford was fired. Well, they transferred him. They made it, he was transferred to Birmingham, Alabama, as a result of our episode in Buffalo. So it shows you, you know, and other agents that would tell me, you know, stand your ground, Ronnie. Stand your ground against this guy. And most of them would, you know, privately. You know, I don't want to mention their names because, well, most of them are retired now anyway. But anyway, what happened is I was teaching down at Quantico at the FBI Academy, and I was also teaching classes over at a, a satellite office of the CIA, uh, but, but different classes. I was teaching on in, in, intelligence gathering uh, areas of, uh, you know, my guys or my uh, tradecraft and how, what I did to enter uh, uh, using the mob at first. You know, I mean, what I did is, is I always tried to stay as close to the vest as possible and as truthful as possible. And, uh, and I also taught Russian classes because I speak Russian at uh, the FBI Academy. I'm lousy, but I I understand it. Uh, I, I'm married to a girl from Belarus, a wonderful girl, my partner. And I spent a lot of years over there. I was sent there. How that came about was Jim Moody. Jim Moody was the section chief of the FBI at that time for organized crime. And he says, Ron, he seen me down at Quantico. He had just come back from Moscow. He said, Ron. You've been sitting on your ass too long. You have to go back to work. So that's what they did. They, they talked to Stan Nye, who was being sent to Poland. And he says, yeah, you know, they want you to, to work this Russian mafia stuff, things like that. And so, uh, you know, you're going to be given a cover. I didn't know what that meant. I was never given a cover. But anyway, I, I did go over there. And I worked for a number of years, mostly in intelligence gathering. At first, I was always just told, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, don't act. That's what they tell me. Well, of course, how do I not act? You know, and me and my big mouth, I, well, I work my way in, but I find out a lot about arm smuggling to Al Qaeda, some of the players, how they were getting them out of Russia, Belarus, things like that. I've actually been in their houses, some of these people. Uh, as a result of my working my way and went through, it takes time. You just don't walk in and here I am. You know, you have to have, you know, a valid reason. Mine was the liquor business. We were importing liquor from Belarus, white, white Russia. Lukashenko knows of me, you know, as the ambassador from Belarus and I were quite close, Valery Sepkalo. And I got to meet a lot of people while I was there. I learned about the, you know, a lot of the terrorists operating out of Geneva, Switzerland, uh, how their finances were being taken place, Warsaw, Poland. And in fact, I'm in a Polish program over that, the arms smuggling out of Russia. And some of these are still alive. Some of these are major uh, arms dealers. And they were getting them to the, the various terrorist groups. 
I probably was at a restaurant with Victor Butt. I'm not sure it was him though. Victor Butt, you know, one of the yeah, uh, yeah. terrorists that they just yeah, yeah, traded I'm, for Brittany Griner, who they made a yeah, movie about called. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm pretty uh, sure I was. But Lord of I'm War. Not, yeah, because I was told to look be on the lookout for him. So this was in Moscow though. When I'm in Moscow, we would go to dinner with a lot of the organized crime people, and these are young kids. You don't realize these kids are worth billions of dollars. You know that the the bravat the, the various groups, the, the Silo Vicky. Uh, and we'd go to dinner and with the different mobsters. And I had a guy by the name of Mistranko, Igor Mistranko. He used to always show his, his government ID anytime things were going on. And I never did get to see what his ID was, but we hung around together. And, and, and I got to meet a lot of the mobsters. And eventually, I got to meet a lot of the politicians. There's I think not much of a difference, right? Well, some, I mean, some of the politicians were, weren't bad. Uh, Alexander Orloff, the deputy foreign minister, and I were quite close. I liked him. I got along good with Alexander. In fact, he helped me with the Jack Platt story, Jack Platt, the, the Gennady Vasilenko case. He was one of the people. I became close with Timothy Borden. He was a, assigned to the American embassy for, here, for economics here, sent back to Russia. We get together on Tabaskaya, well, so that's the main drag, going to the Kremlin. And we go up to the Ukraina, the Ukrainian restaurant, and have a good meal. I take him for a meal, and I would get, you know, and I asked him to help too. Well, a lot of this turned out that, uh, you know, I developed a lot of rapport, and I learned a lot, and I had a lot of friends within uh, the, the Kremlin, you know, plus the Bob. You know, I got to know them all. So my front at that time, or one of the things I was doing is I was going to help him get Stolichina vodka back. And uh, so I had to meet with uh, all the different people, logging off all the people that ran that uh, operation. So it was Plato Import with the missing all. So just uh, uh, as we I wrap, could go on and on. I could go on. I mean, it was experience. I, I, I want to tease this, though, because as we wrap here, it looks like you're going to be a character possibly in a big Hollywood film that's being developed right now with Bradley Cooper and um, Christian Bale. It got, uh, it got announced in the last month in the Hollywood trades. It's a, a true story. Uh, two, two, uh, two of my uh, contemporaries, uh, authors that I have so much respect for, Gus and Eric, uh, wrote a book called uh, The Best of Enemies. It's about two spies, an American spy and a Russian spy, uh, and their relationship. And um, Ron played a played a role in, in the story and uh they're being bradley cooper looks like he's going to be writing this and directing it and starring in it and uh it could be a pretty cool project for uh for us to see uh yeah see you see you on the see you on the big screen have uh yeah. uh you know uh, uh george clooney playing uh <laughs> Ron Fino. yeah that, that i'll tell you it, it, it was tough it was much more difficult because i had the russian mob get involved Yes. Somehow, that may have been my fault. I was talking to this Giorgio Adremus, who had a lot of connections with judges up in Russia. And somehow, I think this Fadi Darwish, who was a terrorist, learned of it. I get a phone call that they want me to, that they want me to meet somebody up in uh, Moscow. And it turns out to be this Timor. I know Timor. Timor is a flake. He's a killer. And, and who's there with him? Fadi Darwish. And they says, I understand you're, you're, you're willing to pay. They even knew the amount that I was willing to pay. So they're pretty good at their intelligence, too, uh, to get them out of jail, you know, to, to do what we can. We can do it. We can do it. And I told them, you know, I, I can't do that. I explained to them I cannot do that. And I let Jack Platt know that Timor had contacted me. And I, I, I explained to him I couldn't do it. But what they did is they went around my back and went to get out his kid. And they forced him to go in and they stole money from him. They took his money. I learned about it. There were things that happened as a result. I wasn't able to get uh, uh, Fadi, but things were done. There was a couple of them involved in it. Some action was taken. And it was by friends of mine in Russia that did it. Now, you got to realize, too, I was close to the PLO. I had a lot of PLO people that were providing me with information that wanted to become aligned with us. Today, they're either in jail or they're dead. So it's changed that when I go over there, you know, I don't want to tell the whole story because it's going to be in a movie, uh, but it was a tough racket. It's you're putting your life on the line and I got to bribe a judge. Right. You don't know. I was, you know, I know the law. 
Did I violate the law? Yes, because we have international treaties that protect it. But, you know, I have no choice. This guy's going to get killed. They're going to kill this man. Jack was communicating with me daily. And the problem was, I, you know, I had to wait till I, I got back to Germany before I could, you know, Frankfurt or one of those places before I could communicate with him. Because, you know, over there, you don't, it's not like the movies. You're not wearing disguises. You're out there in plain sight. You know, you don't hide in the shadows. You're out there in the open. And you got to have a mouth. Yep. You've got to have, you, you got to have the proper handle on it. So you try to stay with the truth as much as possible because they're not stupid. They're better trained than we are. Take my word for it. They're good. So I was close to them. I was close to Belarus. Belarus still is the Belarusian KGB, KGB. And I was close to them. You know, I had my friends because, you know, when I tell them some of the things I found out about the arms smuggling, well, the problem is Lukashenko was involved in it too. But I, I'm showing my character because they're going to trip you up. They're too good at it. It's, you know, we, you see these guys wearing disguises. or I've been mean, sure there are some trade crafts that I'm not going to go into. But I just say with mine, I kept it as what I had learned through the years with the mob and carried it forth into Russia and other places, out to Siberia. I've been there with the, you know, the, uh, the Bagadan, Kamchatka, uh, the Habrusk. You know, we've been all over because of the seafood. We know how the seafood was coming in, you know, how they're selling it in, 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 in the Korean situation. As well. There was a lot. You've and, done it. You've done it all. You've said it all. I, I really, uh, I, I'm not I'm not saying this just because you're on the show with me and I'm talking to you, but your life could easily be a movie or a television series. And yeah, I, would, I, would, you know, I would be a rabid uh, consumer of that because. Well, De Niro uh, said that to me. Yeah, you know, he was too busy wrapped up in other movies, but he he wanted to see a movie. I mean, it's amazing. Thank you yeah. so much for coming on here and shedding some perspective on on the Buffalo uh, underworld and the labor unions, and obviously the last uh, 10, 15 minutes talking about your work for the CIA in Russia. This was a great interview. Thank you so much for joining us, Ron. You're welcome, Scott. Anywhere you, you want welcome. people to know where they can find you. Yeah, you could always. I mean, I wrote a book. I have a. I really. No, I know. I, I wanted to. That's what I'm saying. I want to promote your book. Yeah, yeah. I wrote that, Mister Undercover. Mm -hmm. uh, that's available on Amazon. I just don't build myself up I'm, as much as it sounds like it. I'm really not. I'm more of a, a humble person. You know. No. Well, I had to. You know. Yes, I will. I will yeah. vouch for that. Uh, you would never know just talking to Ron or getting to know Ron a little bit. You would never know that this is. Uh, that he has such layers to his story. There are other people that before you even can get a word in edgewise, they're trying to tell you about all the craziness that they've lived in their lives. Ron, you kind of have to peel back the layers and, and get, yeah. and you know, uh, earn his trust for him to, to tell you all that. Yeah. Well, well thank, thank you, Scott, everybody. Let's hope it's a better new year than what we've had. Yes. And let's hope it's safe because, you know, I'm an honorary sub. Bro. I don't know if I told you that. That yeah. means a we. You know, I have many friends in Israel. The late General Motagor, the organizer of the raid in Entebbe, was very close. So uh, I, I know the problem with terrorism because I worked it. Yeah. And if, I can't understand people that they're grasping on. That's because of our the, the educational system today. They're teaching these people it's okay. That Osama yeah. bin Laden was a good guy. I mean, well, it's, it's, this younger generation that's getting their history from TikTok, there's no context. Um, it's it's scary. It really sure is. Sure, it's scary because we're destroying our country. We're destroying it. Ron, have a great yeah. new year, and uh, well, hopefully we'll bring you back on, and uh, maybe uh, you can do a second part and, and talk a little bit more just about your PI work and your CIA work, and and yeah. uh, it could be a, an episode on its own. Well, sounds great, Scott. Everybody. Thanks, Ron. Be you good. You take care. Be good. And uh, for OG Pod, I'm Scott. Bernstein. We'll see you next week. Out. God bless you, my friend. Take care.